Assalamu alaikum, welcome to Questions on British Muslim TV with me, Mohammed Shafiq. We're broadcasting on Sky Channel 752 and across social media at British Muslim TV. Wherever you are joining us around the world, a very warm welcome. We want to hear your thoughts and experiences on the stories we're featuring tonight. Call us on 01924-231-083 or on the WhatsApp number which is on your screen. Now, the death toll has reached 217 in Gaza, including 63 children. Israeli warplanes have bombed the small enclave, which has been described by the United Nations as an open-air prison. Israel says 12 people in Israel have also been killed, including a small baby. 300 Israelis have been injured. The Israeli army has said hundreds of rockets have been fired from Gaza towards various locations in Israel, and they've added reinforcements near the border with Gaza. The humanitarian crisis has got worse with thousands of Palestinian families taking cover in United Nations-run schools in northern Gaza to escape Israeli military firepower. The United Nations now estimates that 50,000 Palestinians have left their home in northern Gaza to Gaza City. The Al Jala building in Gaza City, which houses international media, or which did house international media, including the Associated Press and Al Jazeera, was bombed with one hour notice on Saturday. This is a building I visited in 2013, and according to reporters, without borders is a war crime, which the Israeli government has rejected. Israel said Hamas used this building and other civilian homes as human shields, and they further become legitimate targets, according to the Israel, Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now, protests and rallies have been held across the world in solidarity with Palestine, with a large crowd seen in London, New York, Washington, D.C., Karachi, Istanbul, and Jakarta. The United States President Joe Biden has said Israel retains a right to defend itself from the rockets launched by Hamas and other groups. But the Democratic representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, from New York criticized President Biden for taking the side of occupation. She said that President Biden's remark do not recognize that the events that led her to the latest round of rocket attacks dehumanize Palestinians and implies that the U.S. will look the other way at human rights violations. President Biden's senior official for Israeli and Palestinian affairs, Hadi Amr, has been sent to Israel to aid in de-escalation efforts, which have remained unsuccessful. The Egyptian, Jordanians and French governments are in talks with the Israeli and Palestinian sides to try to get a ceasefire. The Israeli Defense Minister, Benny Gantz, has said Israel is not preparing for a ceasefire. There is currently no end date for the operation. Only when we achieve complete quiet can we talk about calm. He added, he, he said, we will not listen to moral preaching against our duty to protect the citizens of Israel. Meanwhile, the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas, has said his government is doing everything possible to defend the people of Palestine. He said the continued aggression of the occupation forces against our people everywhere, including the aggression on the Gaza Strip, exceeded all limits, throwing out all international norms and conventions. He criticized Israel for targeting children and young women. And he condemned the inaction of the international community. We'll keep an eye on what is happening in Gaza tonight and update you accordingly here on British Muslim TV. Now, in other news, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said there's nothing conclusive in the data that means England would have to deviate from the roadmap out of lockdown. The government still plans to end remaining limits on social contact from the 21st of June. However, there's increasing concern about the Indian variant. Shortly, we head to Birmingham to talk to our regular contributor and community activist, Shaquille Afsar, about the protest in Birmingham and around the country for Gaza, why the drive slow pro, uh, rallies are causing unnecessary inconvenience to local residents. Shaquille joins us live shortly. Then we head down just up the road here in Wakefield to talk to the founder of Penny Appeal, Adim Yunus, about his new book titled Small Change, Big Difference. And then we finish off in Blackburn to talk to councillor Tiger Patel. He won a sensational victory in a rock solid Labour ward and that viral election campaign video, if you haven't seen it, you must watch it. Uh, you don't want to, uh, that viral election campaign video, everybody was talking about it in the run election. Well, he actually won his seat uh, and we'll be talking to him about his campaign and about that video. And yes, we'll even ask him about that graffiti so you don't want to miss the interview uh, at nine o'clock in the final segment. Now, as I said, we want to hear from you tonight. You can call us on 01924-231-083 or messages on British Muslim TV across social media. Send us a WhatsApp message. The number is on your screen. Now, the questions we're considering tonight. How does the violence in Gaza impact the wider world? 
How should we celebrate British Muslim success like Adeem Yunus? And what do you make of Tiger Patel's viral video and victory? Please share your thoughts now on 01924-231-083. Your message is on WhatsApp. The number is on your screen as I keep telling you. So please, please, please share your thoughts. Let's start with our first guest. Ever since the violence and killing in Gaza began last week, across the UK, cities and towns, there is protest and rallies in support of the Palestinian people. In Birmingham, there was a drive slow on the A38 and Queensway tunnel in what organisers said was in response to increased Israeli military attacks. She Shaquille Afsan knows the organisers and was present during the drive slow. The drivers have been criticised by the police for putting themselves and other drivers in danger, but organisers said it was an alternative to protest due to COVID-19 restrictions and the pandemic. I'm pleased to say Shaquille Afsar is joining us live from Birmingham. Shaquille Afsar, very warm welcome to the programme. It's great to have you back. Thank you very much for having me, Shafiq. It's always good to be back. Uh, tell me, what, what's your reaction to the violence in, in Gaza and Israel? Because he's really Well, good again, and... I think the reaction with any human being would be of a, un, a, a sheer worry for the people of Palestine. Any basic person with basic human rights would understand and would feel the pain of the people of Palestine, uh, a, a government, a country that has no military, has no finance, has is uh, water that enters the country is dictated by its occupiers. I think any person with any human rights feelings towards them can feel for the people of Palestine at the moment. Now, the Israeli government said that the bombing is down to the rockets being launched by Hamas into Israeli territory. Do you accept that the rockets launch should be condemned by the international community? To be honest with you, I do believe that the rocket uh, should be condemned, but one should ask a question. One should ask a question. It's uh, the, the way that the propaganda is being pushed by the Israeli administration is as if, why is a woman punching her rapist in the face? Now, if you are being bombed by strategic high tech, tech technology, hmm. what do you expect the Palestinians to do? Do you expect them to roll over and die? Because from what I hear in the political sphere and what I hear online, the Israeli establishment seems to blame this all on Hamas, but does not realize that it's children who are dying. It's schools which are being bombed. It's up high-rise buildings which are being... Which justification is this? If they really want to capture a Hamas, maybe why not uh, uh, try ground uh, tactics? Why are they bombing people from left, right and center? Why are we seeing children dying? Why are we seeing mothers crying? Why are we seeing parents losing their children? It's a whole whitewash in regards to the propaganda that the Israeli establishment is pushing out there to make themselves look like the innocent ones. And the Palestinians on the other side, let's give you the other side because we, we need to remain balanced on this uh, in terms uh, of course. here, uh, in terms of our, our uh, output. And remember, we've asked somebody from the Israeli government, uh, we've reached out to the Israeli embassy, and we've reached out to representatives of uh, Israeli pro-Israeli supporters around the world to come on and give their side. Nobody was available to one. Look, I've got a standard uh, invite to colleagues uh, on the other side. If you want to come and have that discussion and debate, uh, you're very welcome here on British Muslim TV. What was your reaction to the Arab and Muslim government's response? What have you made of their response these past few days? Sorry, you have to repeat that again. You cut out there, Shafiq. Sorry, it's OK. I was saying, what's your reaction to the Arab League and Muslim governments around the world and their response? Well, to be honest with you, I only hope and pray that the Arab League is going to mobilize itself once and for all. We've all seen through us being a British Muslim that the Arab League, unfortunately, according to our standards, is moving far too slow. Only one, uh, only, only they can understand why we are allowing children to be slaughtered, why we are allowing Israel to do what it's doing without putting a full, full force down to protect those innocent people. The, the fact of the matter is, with regards to the Arab League and what their vested interests are, with me as a humanitarian, do they not see these children dying? Uh, for, for, for a message to the Arab League, do you not see these families crying? Do you not see these people suffering? Do you not see up and down the world the people screaming for uh, the freedom mm. of Palestine? So that only answers my question with regards to the Arab League. To be quite honest with you, I think they have been very, very, very slow in the condemnation of what Israel is doing in front of us in broad daylight. And we know this, a number of those countries have established relations uh, with the Israelis the, through the Abrahamic uh, Accords, the UAE, Bahrain, uh, Morocco, 
uh, and um, Sudan. Do you think uh, those countries are regretting that decision? Well, uh, to be honest with you, I think any person after seeing the plight of the Palestinian would regret this decision. And I implore, I implore the Arab governments and I implore all, also the European governments that this is a situation that's very close to the hearts of many people. I myself, as you know, I'm a, a British Kashmiri, um, you know, and I feel for the Palestinians as if they're my own. So this situation is only going to spiral yeah. out of control. And I can, uh, I urge especially the British government. Shafiq, we must remember that this argument and this debate and this fight that has started has all started from the fact that the British government was giving over land that didn't belong yeah. to them in the first place. Because the, the, the occupation has gone on for over 70 years. Do you think it'll yeah. ever end? Well, again, as, as somebody from a community, the Kashmiri community, who has suffered also an occupation for around 70 years, we only hope and pray, Shafiq. We are from a background where we believe in hope, we believe in rights, and we will strive and struggle. We will strive and struggle through whatever comes our way, but we will not allow our values, our morals, and most, most importantly, our beliefs in what we have as humans to be tarnished. Yeah, and what, what did you make of Keir Starmer and Lisa, Lisa Nandi's uh, response, the Labour Party's response? Again, with regards to the Labour Party, I feel the response was only put out there because of it was had to put out there. Because uh, I feel that the Keir Star the, the Labour leader's uh, response was very slow. Uh, you know, children knew what was happening with the Gaza situation, yet condemning it four or five days later and bringing it back down to uh, something in regards to the Labour leader and our uh, our Prime Minister Boris Johnson. We had the anti-Semitism issue in London and everyone's willing to highlight that very quickly, which rightfully so they should do. But where is the voice for the Palestinians? Where is the voice for these people who are having three tons bombs dropped on them? Where are the voice for these children who are losing parents mm. and are becoming orphans? Where are the where is the human rights advocates? Yeah, well, we're going to explore that further with you. Uh, Shaquille Afsan, I know you're staying with us. Uh, John, uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll start the conversation again with Shaquille Afsan and we'll take some of your calls. Uh, please stay with us. Join us on the other side of these very important messages. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohamed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. We're opening the lines now, 01924 You'll get in touch with us on our social media handles. If you're watching this on uh, uh, Facebook or on Twitter, uh, please just post your comment and we'll get through some of them uh, as we do. Shaquille Afsar still with us. Let me give you the latest uh, from, um, uh, from Gaza Strip. Um, at the moment, the death toll has now gone up to 227, of which there's 64 children and 38 women. Um, and, you know, obviously the, the, there's been 12 uh, people who died on the Israeli side, uh, including a young child as well. So we can't forget uh, that life uh, lost as well. Uh, Shaquille Afsai is still with us. Uh, Shaquille, just before the break, we were talking about the Gaza crisis uh, and the international response. Uh, and, you know, last weekend we saw the despicable anti-Semitism uh, carried out by, you know, some fools. Um, obviously, we can't talk too much about them individual, but how can we make sure that um, people understand that anti-Semitism is wrong? Well, I think the simple fact that coming from a faith, of a Abrahamic faith, I think everyone can just bring it back to what our religion teaches us. Though the, this behaviour, the uh, you know anti-Semitism, any form of discrimination towards any individuals, and my is unacceptable. My personal view is we have never begin uh, been against the Israeli civilians. Our issue, our problems is with the Israeli establishment and it should be left at that. Those words without me uttering them again were absolutely disgusting. And I would like to say on behalf of the, the British Muslim community here in Birmingham, those are not our people. They do not represent us in any way, shape or form. Mm. Neither, neither will we allow them to be a party to the freedom of Palestine movement because we have been, we have remained legal we have remained within the confines of the law because that's what we want. We haven't had brothers and sisters lose lives over the last 70 years for us to behave 
the same way as our oppressors. Now, we know we're going to talk about that Birmingham protest and the, the drive slow in a second, but there's protests, for example, in Warrington this Saturday. There's one in Rochdale again uh, on Sunday. There's one in London as well. Lots of protests. There seems to be something different this time. More people joining rallies and protests. Do you think this is a turning moment in the international response to what's going on in Gaza? Well, well, absolutely. You, fa you, you forgot to mention there's another protest at Leicester outside Elbit Systems who provide the drones to the established, mm. uh, Israeli establishment on Friday at 5 p.m. And yeah, absolutely. I, I firmly believe the stone for freedom of Palestine has been rolled, Shafiq. I believe now uh, it has actually empowered a lot of... I can only speak from Birmingham. We have the largest Kashmiri community here. And let me just to reiterate that the Kashmiris actually feel and know exactly what the plight of the Palestinians are because our plight has been nearly for the same amount of duration. We are suffering from a, a BJP administration that behaves the same way as the Israeli, Israeli state establishment. So I can give you one guarantee for this now. Birmingham will not stop. It will be a continuous event until we re reach some progressive change in the plight of the Palestinians. Now, do you accept that the inconvenience of those drive slow protests that we saw, uh, I think it was last weekend, uh, was it Friday, I think, um, Friday, towards yes. ordinary residents in Birmingham is not the way forward? Again, 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 uh, as uh, being somebody who was assisting these people with the protest, their argument is that we feel that the British civilians as a whole are not understanding of the situation. They don't actually understand that it was us the British citizens who caused yeah, this but problem. Yeah, but if you want to, Palestine. if you want to win hearts and minds, uh, Shaquille, on the issue of Gaza and Israel, surely inconveniencing people who need to go to work, they might have a family emergency. There was issues around uh, ambulances being able to get through. Um, that doesn't win. That doesn't win hearts and minds. Absolutely, and, and, and I did uh, reiterate this to the organisers on the day that maybe a static protest should be arranged. But again, uh, Shafiq, it's the level of barbaric treatment by the Israeli administration that is motivating and really getting people very emotional here in the United Kingdom. And, 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 and I completely agree with you that disrupting people and causing uh, unnecessary nuisance to individuals is not acceptable. The organizers did assure me that they did everything in their power to make sure that they liaise with local police and stuff. But it it's just a very emotional time, and I yeah. and I can say that. And to be fair to you, to be that this is not going to stop. Uh, sorry to interrupt again, but uh, to be fair to you, the organisers have said to have said to us uh, that the reason they did this drive slow protest was because of COVID nineteen and the ongoing restrictions. Is that something they said yeah, to you I'm, as well? I, yeah, absolutely. And again, this was the reason I did kind of reiterate to them that maybe you know they should try to get more organizing staff there. But again, their argument to this was that, look, we are the only people who have arranged a COVID safe event. And at that point, I said, look, OK, let's go ahead with it. And I can try to assist you to make sure there's as less disruption as possible. Mm. And then we were talking earlier on about the anti-Semitism, the incident in London, uh, in Finchley. Uh, and we've had a, a, a rabbi, I think, who's been attacked as well. Um, and, and obviously the people involved in that have been arrested and charged. So we can't really talk about the case. But just generally, how can we make sure that at these pro-Palestinian rallies, that people understand from the platform that anti-Semitism isn't acceptable and isn't a, no. uh, 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 shouldn't be excused by any... And to be fair, can I just say this as well? Uh, many on the Palestinian Solidarity Campaign, many on the Palestinian uh, campaigns... Uh, pro-Palestinian campaigns have been very quick to condemn this anti-Semitism and say that it doesn't have a place in our society. How can we educate our youngsters uh, on this particular Look, issue? I, I think with the main thing with the educators that, uh, and uh, to educate the youngsters is that you cannot treat someone in a way that we are saying to stop the Palestinians being treated. You cannot speak to somebody in a way that our Palestinians... and 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 regardless of how, you know, against the Palestinians' mm. one's view might be, we must not criticise them in a way to discriminate them. We must have an open, fair opinion and a debate. Mm. And anti-Semitism, any form of discrimination in any Abrahamic faith is grossly unacceptable. Um, I've got less than three minutes, so let's give, let's give you two, 
two quick questions. Uh, the Israelis are saying that the rockets that have been launched at Israeli territory, in which Israeli children have, have died as well, um, are the reason why they are having to take this military action. What would you say in reaction to that? I think my, my simple answer to that was that sounds a bit like as if why is the woman punching her rapist uh, sort of scenario. And I can only say that Hamas as an organization or the defense, you know, uh, we can only see that from what time, from what time in the years mm. that is uh, Palestine was taken over and how long after uh, Hamas was formed. So, you know, if somebody is going to be attacked, you cannot expect them to just die and roll over. They will defend themselves. And one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist and another man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Yeah, I think you're referring there to the great Nelson Mandela uh, quote. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, my final question, Shaquille, uh, I, I really uh, pinch myself sometimes because time flies absolutely uh, with you. But what's your message to our viewers who are hoping to go to protests, like I said, in Warrington, outside the town hall on Saturday, in Rochdale, at Broadfield Park um, uh, on Sunday? There's lots of other protests. You mentioned the Leicester one. There's one in Birmingham. There's one in London. Uh, what's your message to our viewers who want to go to this protest and how they can raise their voice, but also be conscious uh, about not uh, demonising or attacking uh, the Jewish community? I think of the message that I would like to give everybody is when you are attending a protest, you must be respectful and not they are not our teachers. Regardless of those people, how they are treating our Palestinians, they are not our teachers. We must also always show that we are respect respectable, we are understanding, and all we want is the freedom of our oppressed people. And a message to my youngsters especially, you know, jumping up and round and behaving in a way that you may seem is acceptable will damage the Palestinian cause. The best thing you can do and uh, for the Palestinian people is stand up a process and scream free Palestine. Contact your members of yeah. parliament, rally around people okay. who don't know about the Palestinian Thank you so issue. Much. But, but, but that is the, it, it must be a respectful way because they Thank are you not so much. our teachers. Uh, great to see you. Thank you for joining me. Uh, Allah, I pray that Allah keeps you safe and your family safe. That was Shaquille Afsa, community activist and campaigner from Birmingham. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk to Dean Muniz uh, live about his new book. Uh, join us on the other side of this. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. We're taking your calls now on 019242310833. You get in touch with us on our social media handles at British Muslim TV. Now, the story of Adim Yunus is one of success and public service. From humble beginnings in Wakefield, he established Penny Appeal, which is now helping some of the most vulnerable communities around the world and even helping here at home in the UK. There's been many ups, but there's also been some lows. And in his book titled Small Change, Big Difference, he charts his story, which many can identify with. Uh, he's my special guest. I'm really excited to learn more about his journey and how he achieved his success. And I'm pleased Adim Junis, uh, I'll put my teeth back in. Adim Yunus is joining us live from Wakefield. Adim Yunus, uh, salam alaikum, a warm welcome to the program. It's really great to have wa you on. Salam, wa alaikum salam. Shafiq, I'm a huge fan. And uh, you've got a great show. You've got a great lineup today as well. So I'm really honoured to, to have you squeeze me in. Do you know, I, I think I finally made it. Now I'm interviewing you. I think uh, my story is <laughs> complete as well. Let's start at the beginning. Uh, something which I strongly identify with uh, in your book is losing your father at a very young age cause, and your mum being a strength. Uh, you know, I really identify with that because, you know, my, my father died when I was 10 uh, and my mum was my strength. Tell us about that period. I guess as a, as a child, you you know whether you were born into poverty or you were born in a palace, you that's all you know. Um, so that that was my world, that was my life. Uh, but one thing that I did know was my mum was extra extra special. She was a a, a pillar not just for the family, but a, a pillar in the community and a, a role model for many many more people than than, my, than myself. In the, imagine uh, an, an Asian woman, a Pakistani woman, a Muslim woman in the eighties. Uh, you can imagine. Uh, the, the the you know the stigma attached uh, around um, you know being a widow, being single, uh, and then you know going. My, my mum learned how to sew. My mum was uh, what we what we know now as a as, as an entrepreneur. Mm. What what people call me, but you know I've gone through a lot of opportunities. I've been trained. I've got 
skills. I've gone to university and, and so on and so forth. And I've been through and I've seen businesses. Uh, mom didn't. Mom, mom was a uh, yeah. She was she was a housewife. Um, she came to the country in her late teens. English wasn't her first language. She learned how to drive. She learned how to sew. Uh, she started up a business at home. Then she went to Wakefield Market, and then she. From there, she had her own retail premises on Brook, Brook Street, which is in the center of town. Uh, and amazing, amazing journey mm. and something that a lot of people in the community, a lot of other Muslim women, Asian women, and kind of just the community, you know, at large were, you know, really, really proud of her. Um, and to the, and, the, and the slash, you know, she, she, she became like a center point in the community, a go-to person. And even now, you know, sadly with, with all the, the, the death that we had through COVID, she's the, she's the person that people kind of go to and say, look, we're doing a janazah or there's, 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 this, there's this funeral that's happened, this family, this old lady's passed away or kind of like a, a khala community auntie who's passed away. Can, what do you advise? How do we do this? How do we console the family and, and so on and so forth? So some, somebody, somebody's really had a lot, of, a lot of social impact. Yeah. And then from working in a restaurant, you set up singlemuslim.com, which today is the world's largest matrimonial service Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Uh, tell us what attracted you to singlemuslim.com. <laughs> that was my mum's fault as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so now you praise her, now it's uh, time to uh, portion some blame to that way. So, you know, mum, being a single parent, I, I, and I, I'm sure you can identify with this as well, uh, a lot of pressure on her shoulders in terms of, you know, bringing up three children, myself and two younger siblings. Uh, and, you know, when, when it came to the late teens myself mom was like you need you need to get married now you know what are what are what's local gonna say what are people gonna say you know i've brought you up and i've tried my best and now you need to go and set up your own family you need to go do your own thing um so you know kind of mom what's the options so and mom says have you got somebody i'm like mom of course i haven't got anybody you know all my life you've been telling me having a girlfriend is haram it's not allowed <laughs> and now you're asking me if i've got somebody it's like I'm, eh I, what's, that doesn't make any sense so she says, well, if you've not got anybody, we can always go to Pakistan and get you married to your cha-cha's daughter. <laughs> I'm like, I can't get married to my cha-cha's daughter. That's like, that's someone I see as my sister. That's somebody <laughs> we've been brought up and calling your sister and, and so on and so forth. And now you think I'm going to get, plus the culture and the society is just very, very different, very, very different. So she says, okay, why don't you find somebody? And I'm like, find somebody, find somebody where, you know, at, at college, my college is full of, you know, non-Muslims and um somebody that I can't really identify with, somebody I don't really see kind of settling down with. Uh, in work circles, again, there's nobody there that's suitable, some, nobody that's compatible. So I had this crazy idea whilst I was setting up a business, a, a design business, uh, an IT kind of web agency at that time. Mm. I says to the, the team that I was working with, I said, I've got a great idea. Why don't we set up a, a matrimonial website, a dating website for Muslims specifically for the purpose of marriage? And everybody thought I was bonkers. They're like, yeah, the Dean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, after, after a while, I kept pursuing this thing. And it's like, okay, Dean, just to, just to make you quiet, just to shut you yeah. up, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll do something, we'll try something. Anyway, as soon as we set it up, back in 2000, at the time of the dial-up internet, do, 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 do you know, remember the, yeah, yeah. the old dial-up? Dial-up, yeah. And, and people didn't even know what the internet was back then. As soon as we registered this thing, as soon as it went live, we started having registration straight away. People were registered from, from the UK, from Germany, from America, from Australia, mm. all around the world. We've literally got a registration, well, hundreds, if not thousands of registrations from every single country in the world right now. And um, yeah, so then I kind of went on this journey of trying to find somebody. Um, and I did, alhamdulillah, um, I met my then wife on, on the website. Uh, and I remember coming back to the office and I said to Steve, I said, Steve, I think I found the one. And he <laughs> says, okay, all right, boss, shall we close the website down? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I says, no, 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 you can't close the website now because it wasn't, it's not a, it wasn't my problem and a challenge for me. Finding a suitable, compatible Muslim partner, somebody of the Muslim Islamic faith mm. in the West, it was actually a problem of a whole generation, it was a problem of second, third mm. generation. And still to this day, I feel the biggest challenge for Muslims is how to get married and how to keep married, you know? So it's, yeah, yeah. it's still very, very relevant now. And now, you know, it's so common. Single Muslim is now an app. Uh, we're a huge, fully integrated app. Uh, again, we're accessible. We're all, we're all, we're all over the world. Yeah. It, it, it's doing amazing. And we've had over 100,000 marriages 
And that's only the ones that we've heard about. So that's 100,000 people. And if you can imagine, Shafiq, when we set up 21 years ago, if somebody got married in the first year and had a child, that child would be 20 years old now. So wow. they could they could use the website themselves. They could be, so, you know, could be ready for marriage. Now. Or they, could, they could be. They could. They could be on the website. So yeah. you see that as just just mind-boggling the it kind is, of yeah. the, the, the legacy that we've set up, and that's all from a small town city so, here in, in in Wakefield, West Yorkshire. And 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 so is 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 uh, that success then gives you the opportunity to come up with the idea of Penny Appeal? How did that happen? The idea for Penny Appeal is yeah, basically it stems from that success. It stems from the fact that we were able to realize our kind of aspirations, our business goals, um, have financial freedom, have the ability to question ourselves in terms of what is life all about? Because, you know, people spend a whole lifetime trying to get a career or kind of get to a, get to a stage where they're settled, where they're financially free, where they're able to kind of like find themselves or explore the world. Uh, Alhamdulillah, Allah blessed us with something which was the dot com dream basically the the digital dream the ability to you know make money whilst we're sleeping on a weekend on a bank holiday uh, and alhamdulillah alhamdulillah you know it, the the question then arose in my mind that you know I lost my father when I was very young but what is the purpose of life what is it all about what what we're we doing here um and surely there's more to, to to life than servers and google and ppc and and so on and so forth you 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 you're massing this amount of money but what are you going to do with it you can only you can only sleep in so many beds. You can only eat so much food. You can only drive around in so many cars. What is it all about? Uh, and that's where I take, took a journey of discovery back to my ancestral home um, in uh, Pakistan, a very rural village in, in northern Pakistan. Mm. And when I went there, initially it was a beautiful, tranquil, romantic location overlooking the hills. You know, the sun coming up on the morning, the sun going down on the night, cock a doodle doo, camels, buffaloes, and everything. But I realized that the reality was very, very different for the people that lived there. There was no roads, there was no running water, there was no gas, there was no electricity. And it was just a very, very harsh reality. If people didn't have the crops uh, that, was, that were kind of forecast for that year, they'd be in debt and they'd struggle for the whole entirety of next year. They might not come over that bad harvest for five, six years. And you know, if somebody, somebody had a pneumonia here in the UK, if you have pneumonia, I say, Shafiq, oh, you're not feeling well? Yeah, I've got a pneumonia, I've been diagnosed, I'm going to go to the hospital. Oh, no, no problem, Shafiq, I'll see you, I'll see you Friday, I'll see you Saturday, if not, mm. I'll, see you, I'll see you on Monday. In Pakistan, mm. you know, small kind of minor illnesses like that mean that your family may never ever see you again. That, yeah. that might be fatal, that will kill you. We've got about- I've seen it with my own eyes, you know, people that have yeah. very, very small illnesses that, have, that are no longer with us because of that. Yeah, we, we've got about three minutes before the break. I just wanted to get this, get this question in. Uh, did you ever think at that time when you were setting up Penny Appeal that it would end up being a hundred million pound charity and helping change lives around the world so much? Never, never. Not in my wildest dreams did I think that the charity would get to, you know, I thought maybe we set up a, an orphan home, we set up a few wells, uh, we, we, we'll, we'll help a few teachers, um, but that was it, you know. It wasn't, it wasn't anything big at all, but to where we are right now, working in 56 countries, has been one of the fastest growing, biggest charities in the UK, uh, having the impact that we have around the world, but also here at home, it's just phenomenal, absolutely yeah. phenomenal. You, can, you kind of shaked up the charity sector in that you're having to, you know, in your face sort of thing, um, just to get heard. Uh, and that made a difference because you've helped change the charity sector uh, in the time that you've been on the scene. But I guess, you know, for me, Shafiq, it was quite easy because we come from a digital background. We come from a background where that is what you do. You kind of have an online presence. Um, you, you, you target a specific audience. Uh, you send out scheduled messages. You do a marketing in a, in a specific way. Uh, and that was at its prime. So we literally hit it at the right time where we are donor-led. So if our donors, like, for example, now, sadly, what's happening in Palestine, our donors want to support in Palestine, we are working in Palestine right now. We've sent a huge amount of money um, over the weekend, £320,000, which has been signed off, which has already been, already been delivered to Palestine. Um, and, you know, our donors are looking for the feedback. The feedback is coming in every single day uh, since, the, since the, these, these, these new yeah. troubles uh, have, have come about. And that's what we did from, from, from day one, from when, when Haiti, um, when earthquake happened in er Haiti, and we've had so many issues so many global catastrophes that have happened around the world uh, and 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 even even you know maybe natural maybe kind of man-made 
And even at home, you know, we, we had we had the Grandfell disaster. Our teams were on the ground. Our volunteers were on, on, on the ground. The, 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 the early hours of the morning after the, the, the horrific fires that yeah. happened there. Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we'll continue the conversation with you, Adim Yunus, and learn more about that book that is causing waves in the British Muslim community, but also that breaking news coming in. Uh, Israeli media are now reporting that a ceasefire between Hamas and Israel have uh, potentially been agreed and will come into force on Friday afternoon. We'll give you the latest after the break, but stay with us and we'll continue the conversation with Adim Yunus. Uh, join us on the other side of these important messages. Assalamualaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohamed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. As I said just before the break, the Israeli media are now reporting uh, that Hamas and uh, Israel have reached a ceasefire agreement. Uh, Jordanian, uh, Egyptian and the French governments were involved in those back-to-back -back, uh, negotiations. Um, and Israeli media now reporting that that ceasefire will come into force Friday afternoon. But obviously... We're still waiting to hear official confirmation of that. And obviously, if it comes whilst we're on air, we'll, uh, we'll go to that uh, and, and give you the latest on that. But I'm still joined by Adim Yunus, the founder of Penny Appeal Entrepreneur. He's still with us uh, live from just up the road here in Wakefield. Uh, you know, before the break, Adim, we were discussing what you learned about yourself, you know. But where did the idea of the book come from? The idea of the book, I guess, I guess came from the fact that Penny Appeal is the largest Muslim, British Muslim charity but we're also the most misunderstood British Muslim charity where you know, people don't understand what it, what it is, what is the DNA of Penny Peel, what makes us tick, why we came about, because I guess we were too busy building the work and doing the work and you know, delivering the work um, and fundraising. So we were fundraising and you know, delivering, but we didn't have the chance or the opportunity or we didn't think, think appropriate at the time to tell our story. You know, is our story that important? Uh, but, you know, Everybody's interested in Penny Peel, lo lovers or haters, and people do really, really love us, and people are passionate about us, or people I think that, okay, what's going on here? Why are these guys, why, why have they grown so quickly? Where have they come from? Um, and they're all really interested. So that, that's the idea. So it's about, it's about setting up our stall and uh, kind of explaining our narrative, explaining why we exist, where we've come from, uh, and, and what we're doing here. Uh, and I guess that was, rather than doing that piecemeal and kind of like replying to one person or two people or having a gathering, put this book out there it's um it's it's, it's, it's a brand product of of the charity um and it's all the proceeds of the of, of the book go back to the charity so it's a bit of a no-brainer really yeah and, and you also it's the first time it's the first time the yeah. sector has ever done anything like this so there's the type of transparency that's in the book the kind of the story the board the management uh how the how the uh, charity evolved it's never ever been told in the sector nothing like this has ever been published before and and it's another first for penny appeal yeah, and, and your story wouldn't be complete unless we talk about the challenges you faced these past 12 months, the mini coup which you faced from former colleagues. What was your what was your experience during that period? Because it was quite a lonely experience. You had colleagues who you would probably call friends at the time uh, trying to take over Penny Appeal. Yeah, um, if I'm being honest, it was one of the most traumatic experiences in my life. It was it was really shocking. It was heartbreaking. It was kind of really devastating. It was, like I said, it was very, very lonely. It was, um, yeah, it was, it was painful. It was really, really painful because, you you know, we'd spent years building the team, um, building the organization um, and really selfless, selflessly putting everything that we had, everything that was ours into this organization to grow this organization, days, nights, you know, being away from family, being away from friends. Um, and yeah, oh, you're back. And really, and 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 really, something like this was just—it was just like heartbreaking. How how could this happen? How could anybody? How could anybody? You know. Sorry, I'm just gonna. How could how could anybody do this to us? You know what I mean? How could anybody do this? Why why would anybody do this? Why why? It was just it was it was unthinkable. Um, yeah, just yeah, totally and, devastating. And, and you were abroad when you heard that you were suspended from the charity and an independent investigation had begun. What was going through your mind at the time when you when you were getting this information? I didn't have no I didn't have no intelligence about anything until I landed at Manchester Airport. It's only when I landed at Manchester Airport was I, uh, you know, 
two two of my fellow trustees board members came and and yeah they they didn't really know what to say they were like speechless they were they were like you know we've had we we our our hands have almost been twisted to to this for this pseudo suspension um and we're going to have to take this action um and we're going to have to you know we're going to have and and I and I voluntarily I just said look I I will step aside for an independent process to take place uh and for you, everybody to satisfy themselves for for people to come and look and review exactly what's what's happened um and all these allegations that are being that are being made are are false and 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 I don't I don't agree with any of this um so I kind of like moved myself back and and I did that for um the best part of like 9 months um and that was it was hard because you know the 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 organization wasn't just it wasn't just a charity that I was involved in it's a charity that I founded it's a charity where I had lots of you know good friends that were there people that I worked with for many years relationships that I I built up network stakeholders people that I I brought together um and it was it was part of my lifestyle it was a it was a it was an interest it was a hobby um it was something that I'd really passionate about because I just love giving back and I love making it making a difference and love making that change um so I kind of like almost that, mm. that part of my life just stopped overnight you know sunday evening got back from a, an 8 hour flight from pakistan islamabad to manchester and I was handed this document and said okay the there you go it's, it's life 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 changing they yeah. thank you you know that's it and one of the things to notice here you were cleared of any wrongdoing but in our community there's sort of negative press must have taken a toll on your health and well-being and your family how did you cope during that time it was it was very very challenging it was very very challenging and, and like you said in our community like you know anything that you do good and all the work that we the amazing that we work that we've done through covid and what we're doing right now at, in you know in in palestine nobody's really that but as soon as there's a little bit of a goose you know juicy gossip or as long as there's you know something happens or it's like spreads like wildfire and all these rumors and the allegations and everything was just all over the place and it was it was very very difficult because i wasn't able to say anything because i didn't want to intervene i didn't want to be party to any of the um you know the, the independent review that was going on so i just kept, had to keep my silence i had to back out and just let the let the process just happen and it didn't take days in it didn't take weeks it took months and it just felt like forever and it it did it did impact it impacted on my personal life it impacted on my you know my my work it impacted on my finances it impacted on on, my, on everything in terms of because i had my own legal team that I had to pay independently of of the the team that penny peel had so it was something that i chose to part i chose to be part of the process and and i chose to say look i need i need to have my name cleared i could have just come back and resign and said look i'm not having any of this that that say i'm i'm walking away chose not to walk away i chose to be part of the process but step aside yeah. and let the, that let the independent process take take its you know um what what would you say yeah. what what would you say to those coup leaders um your distract detractors and the people who try to bring you down now i think they were just misguided i think they were just misguided and kind of like you know sadly people just see things differently people want power they want more power they want more influence they want they want to you know they want to take over somebody else's hard work and they want to be able to do the things that maybe they're not they're not in the place or the position to do you know we we set up as a team we set up as a as a community we set up as a movement you know penny peel was a movement penny peel is a movement um and he set out and when he set out and you've got nothing everybody works really hard but when when you start building this thing and you see this thing and it's grown 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 um and 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 there's some individuals that are just want more you know this this is not enough and i don't want to be part of this team i just want to be i want to have the whole team um and alhamdulillah you know people plan man plans and allah plans and allah allah is the best of planners and alhamdulillah uh it is just you know it's it's amazing to have gone through the process and you know what I've, i'm 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 thankful i'm genuinely thankful because i've learned so much through the process i've learned so much about myself about the resilience about who my you know yeah true, I, i was true friends and family up true supporters are people that have been there through you know good times and bad times thick thick and thin and it really does it does and and i guess you know you you 
you learn a, yeah. a, a huge amount. You learn a huge amount. Alhamdulillah. Okay. And, and then you use the investigations to make changes. Uh, obviously, investigation cleared you of any wrongdoing. You're back at the top of, of Penny Appeal. But those lessons are learned. What, what are those lessons? You know, we... We took we took full the, we did a report and the, the report findings are yet to come out and with all the, the 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 guidance on the report and what we've learned in terms of you know improving our governance improving our processes uh, improving the, the the way that things are delegated throughout the the, the organisation because you've got to remember we start off we start off with nothing and we've kind of put the, we put our houses in order we put you know different departments together we grew and then we grew again we grew again and we carried on growing and growing and growing. And that sets up its own challenge, you know. That's that sets up its own kind of how does this thing actually work and where. And we've consolidated, we've expanded the, the trustee board. We've got you know uh, really strong specialist advisors in um, on on a board level, on a senior leadership team level, uh, on a, on a management level. Uh, and really, I think the the charity for me, the organisation, has never been as strong as it is today. Um, and, and inshallah, the, the, the lesson that we've learned, the, the process that we've been through has, has toughened us up, has taught us, you know, where we, what we maybe have missed or what, where our blind spots were. And it's got us to really do a, a root and branch review of everything and come back and come back stronger. And those processes are, are, can only be better for us as an organization. Those process can only be better for us to be able to deliver better, to, to be able to deliver more sustain, sustainable, to be able to deliver projects that have got more impact abroad, but also to have better feedback mechanisms and better processes and better governance here at our HQ as well. Mm. Uh, final question. Thank you, so for, uh, thank you so much for being so honest with, uh, with, with me and the viewers. Uh, what lessons can we learn from the book? I think from the book and from the journey, it's, it's about a power of, the power of a dream uh, and I guess the power of people and the power of what, what we can do as a collective and also what happens when we, the unity breaks and when we're not a collective anymore, when, 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 when we have, you know, when we're not together, when we're not strong and when, when we're not united, what happens then? And, you know, we've, as an organization, we've, we've, we've grown strong with the right people. We've grown strong in unity. We've grown strong because we've had a dream and we've believed yeah. in a dream and we've had a real solid vision. Uh, and then when that's been impacted and when there's been that uh, disunity and what, what, that, what that's led to and how that's impacted the organization and, and hopefully building this back up again and, and, and going back on, you know, starting almost like, like a fresh. Um, yeah, yeah. Just so next basically chapter, isn't it? Power of, a, power of a dream and inshallah, you know, yeah. ne next chapter and the, the start of the next book. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that. I know the book's available uh, on various platforms and all profits are going to Penny Peel, which in itself is quite amazing. Uh, Adim Yudas, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your journey thank with you. us. Um, I think when the story of the British Muslim community is written, you'll be at the heart of it, putting others first and inspiring millions around the world. Uh, thank you so much for your service and leadership, sir. Um, but I just want to uh, say I quoted uh, Channel uh, S, Sorry, Channel uh, Israeli Channel 12 in that breaking news uh, that's claiming that a ceasefire. Uh, we're just waiting for the official response from the Israeli government. Once we get it, we'll bring it to you. Join us on the other side of this for Tiger. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohamed Shafiq. So grateful uh, to Adib Yunus there uh, joining us, talking about his book. Um, and obviously, uh, shortly we'll be talking to the newly elected Conservative councillor, Tiger Patel. Uh, you don't really want to miss this conversation, uh, which is going to happen very, very shortly. But let me just give you a bit more information in regards to what is happening with this Indian variant that has been spreading these past few days across the country. Uh, the health secretary, Matt Hancock, has been addressing a Downing Street press conference uh, this evening at five o'clock. Um, he now says there's been 2,967 cases of the Indian variant. Uh, this is uh, up from 2,300 on Monday. And obviously this is down very much uh, to increased testing, lateral floor testing, but also PCR testing. So you have the lateral floor test which indicates if you've got the virus and then you, you kind of have a second opinion, which is the PCR test. 
um, and that's coming in. Uh, and then you follow that up, I understand, uh, from NHS colleagues that I've been speaking to these past 24 hours, that, that that's then followed up by an additional test to test whether you've got the Indian double variant. Now, further surge testing and vaccination services will be introduced in the following areas. Uh, Bedford, Burnley, Honslow, Kirklees, which includes, uh, let me get my uh, uh, geography right, Kirklees includes, um, what is it? Kirklees is, um, it's Huddersfield, isn't it? Uh, Huddersfield and surrounding areas. Um, you would think that the people from Huddersfield would remind me that Kirklees is their local authority. But yeah, so it's Huddersfield and surrounding areas uh, with Kirklees. There's Leicester uh, and also now North Tyneside. Now, the, he the health secretary has been saying they've been selected via an incredibly sensitive um, biosecurity surveillance system, which has been introduced, which spots the cases in early variant hotspots uh, like in Bolton and in Blackburn. And what they do is they monitor the travel um, patterns uh, and, and really look at where the variant is is going. They do uh, they do tra a test and trace, which is basically find out where people have been, so they can capture other people to make sure that they've been tested and been put on the safe side. Um, and the shocking case in Black in Bolton that the weekly case state has now gone up to two hundred and eighty three per hundred thousand. And it doubled uh, just in the last week. And that's how serious it is. So our plea, not just from the government, from Matt Hancock, but the government, but also, I think, from, from hers in British Muslim TV, to you, our viewers, watching in Bolton, in Blackburn, and some of those other uh, counties and towns and cities I've told you about, it's time to get tested. Even if you haven't got any symptoms, get yourself tested. And what you'll then be able to do is protect yourself from this double variant, uh, which is known as the Indian variant. And then uh, what we will do is keep testing and then get yourself vaccinated. The evidence is clear. The vaccination helps protect your family. It protects yourself and stops you from getting seriously ill. And so lots of people who would end up in hospital and be on a ventilator, it stops that. You may get mild symptoms of coronavirus if you were to get it, uh, but it protects you from that serious um, serious illness, which is really, really important. And that's why, uh, according to Ma Hancock, the health secretary, remember he's just responsible for health services in England, in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland, it's devolved. But in Bolton, there are 25 people who are in Bolton at the hospital, the Bolton Royal Hospital, uh, with COVID-19 with the Indian variant. And the majority of the people there in that hospital who've got COVID are unvaccinated. And some of them will be young people, but lots of them are people who are in the vulnerable category. And so it's touch and go with their lives. And if we can learn anything, it's how do we collectively as a country protect ourselves, our families and our communities. It's no longer about politics and not about the anti-vax debate. This is science proving that this vaccine protects communities. And one of the things I did uh, yesterday, um, I went with my wife for her second job. She had her second job yesterday. Um, and one of the really moving things about that compared to the first job that she had in January was that the majority of people coming through the vaccination centre in Rochdale uh, were from an ethnic minority background. And that shows people now understand the severity of this virus and how important getting that vaccine is. Remember, it's been through so many testing uh, and processes, and that's why it shows you the importance of getting vaccinated, not just once, like I've done, but actually doing, it, do, doing both uh, vaccinations. We're still trying to get hold uh, of Councillor Tiger Patel. So if you're watching Tiger, we'd, we're trying to get in touch with you, trying to get that connection. Uh, for some reason, it, he's not uh, ready yet for us, but when he is, we'll go to him. Um, and I will keep this going. Let's open the lines if we can. Um, 01924 231083 is the number. 01924 231083. And let's uh, give you the WhatsApp number as well. 07950 But as I said, uh, Matt Hancock is very clear that the importance of being vaccinated against COVID-19 will protect you from being seriously ill. 
it won't give you 100% protection because there's already talk about having a booster jab in autumn. The importance is to stop you from getting seriously ill to the point where you put on a ventilator uh, and your lungs struggle to breathe uh, and you struggle to get air into your lungs uh, and your lungs are no longer functioning and that's where uh, you, you know you potentially could die. And as we've seen over this last 15 months or so, we've seen so many people from our community die. Just take a visit. I ask you to take a visit to the graveyard. How many of you would go if you've lost a loved one? Just go visit. I often go to Bradford when I'm there and, and go and visit the graveyard to visit my loved ones. But that graveyard, a uh, Schoolmore Cemetery, I think it is, um, it is massively full. There are so many people within our communities who've lost their life uh, because of this pandemic. And wouldn't it have been great if the, if the vaccine had been discovered earlier so that they could have been protected? But you know, their time was destined, their time was over. We accept that as Muslims. But the reality is that you can, at home, you can save your life. You can save the life of your children and your community by taking this vaccine. And if you're in Bolton, if you're in Blackburn, if you're in Bedford, you're in Burnley, Hounslow, Kirklees, Leicester, North Tyneside, you will be getting uh, surge testing and, and vaccinations. And you are expected, so what will happen in this process, let me just tell you what happens. Volunteers and NHS staff will knock on your door, tell you they're from the local council, for example, and, and ask you to be tested. And they will do the test on your doorstep there and then. And obviously, if, you, if you're positive, it will be followed up with a PCR test, which is, um, in, uh, you know, in one of those uh, testing sites. And then... You'll have a, if that's positive, you'll then have a third test, which is a test to see if it's the Indian variant um, in obviously those communities it, it is spreading. And, and uh, you know, the, the guidance at the moment talks about it potentially, potentially, um, well, so let me get this word out. What it's saying is that the, the Indian variant is more transmissible. That's what the data is suggesting in India and in other parts of the world that where that uh, variant has expanded, expands really quickly, uh, comparison to say the uh, first um, lockdown that we had and the first variant uh, of the coronavirus. Um, and what the chief medical officer, Jonathan Van Tam, known, known as JVT, has said, he was at the press conference alongside Matthew Hancock, the health secretary. He said, uh, they'll know, scientists will know more about uh, trans, trans, transmissibility, let me get my words correctly, of the new Indian variant uh, by some time next week. Now, you know this and I know this. For three weeks before Britain put India on the red list, I was saying to you, our viewers, why is India, which was getting 240,000 cases, of which many were of the Indian variant, why the government and scientists, health experts in this country, the decision makers refusing to put India on uh, the red list. We saw cases in Pakistan, for example, reaching 4,000, 4,500 uh, in Bangladesh as well. And those countries put on the red list. Yet India wasn't put on the red list. And it took another two weeks, yes, two weeks, for Boris Johnson, and Matthew Hancock and others in government to put India on that red list. So we asked the question, why did it take two more weeks when that virus, the variant of the virus, of the coronavirus, was spreading like wildfire in places like Bolton and Blackburn? And Blackburn, the community that is so devastated by this coronavirus pandemic. Do you remember how devastating it's been in terms of how many people have had that virus uh, and the, the sort of negative media coverage, if you like, of that town? And so that is something uh, which really concerns you. And so why did it take two weeks? Obviously, the government will argue that they follow the science. They're waiting for that data to come in. But surely, if, if, if a country was getting 240,000 cases per day, was seeing that the Indian variant, which is already of, of concern to health professionals, including the World Health Organization, around the world, 
there are government allowed for flights to still come in of that variant of that variant and uh, it, from the moment they made a the decision uh, it was still uh, at least a few more days until um, you know i think it was a week if i'm correct until those restrictions came in place in terms of flights from india again this is not about being anti-indian it's not about being anti-pakistani or anti-bangladeshi and it's not even being anti-government it's it's really okay um so i want to show you councillor tiger patel are you there yes he is tiger assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh good evening everybody how are you i'm good thank you uh, we've got about a minute uh, before we go to our break i'm really glad that you uh, are here 60 seconds um during the recent local elections one campaign video went viral around the world because it showed tiger patel giving peace signs in a rundown park what the labor party didn't expect was the safe seat would fall to the conservatives and tiger patel was elected with a comfortable victory he stood as an independent uh, before joining the conservative party and winning on may the 6th he's been described by many as the blackburn's boris johnson and some say this is the first step in his political journey where next he's with us as you can see on the screen we finally got him uh, on the screen as uh, a really excited tiger um, i know we've got less than 20 seconds uh, we'll come to you just after this short break and then we'll have our conversation tiger patel is on the screen ladies and gentlemen tiger don't go anywhere we're coming back uh, join us uh, after these very important messages and you don't want to miss this interview with Tiger Patel, his first broadcast interview. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back. I know you don't want to hear me. You want to see and hear from Tiger Patel. He's joining us live now from Blackburn. Uh, Tiger, a very warm welcome. First of all, congratulations. Wow, you pulled off uh, what was uh, a very surprise victory there for you. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Muhammad Safiq Saab. And I say everybody who was about to see my interview, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and the United Kingdom, my community people. So it's not a surprise, but I'm 110%, inshallah, that time when I filled the form for the Conservative Party candidate, I won, inshallah, and I won. Now, I'm... Um We'll talk about the Conservative Party in a second, but just tell us, um, you believed you were going to win. Your Labour Party opponents, according to my sources, uh, uh, were saying they were laughing at you. Your opponent was laughing at you, your, um, allegedly, um, and the Labour Party thought um, you were a laughing stock. Who's laughing now? Uh, they are not laughing now. They are now serious. Because, you know, when I get the result and I won, and I do but the good work with the community people, but they are now serious. They are not now laughing. Yeah. Okay, so l explain it to me in a, a simple uh, language, Tiger. What does it mean to be a member of the Conservative Party? Why are you a Conservative? I'm a Conservative candidate, and I won this election about this in my Audley and Queen's Park ward. When they give me an offer about this uh, as a candidate in my Audley and Queen's Park, so first I discuss with my about the supporters, and last time they give me a support and everything. So they say about the much better than you stand for the independent. So you stand about the one party, hmm. and it's the national party. So you get the good advantage from hmm. the they have party votes, and you have a friends, family members, and people know you very well, yeah. the surrounding area where I'm living. So, does, so, so not anything in particular attracts you to the Conservative Party, just the fact that you wanted to win? Yeah. <laughs> I love your honesty. Thank you. Honest, um, honestly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you know what? I, this, is, this is what politicians watching this around the world, yeah? This is what you need to learn. You need to be honest with your voters. Yeah, honest, honest. And honest, you're honest, man. Tiger Patel, and I salute you, sir, for being so honest. Just tell us, where did the idea of this viral video, if you haven't seen it, you've got to see, where did the idea of the video come from? Is this 
this idea from about the coming from about this you know united kingdom president about the boris johnson bojo and about the when i watch about the imran khan in pakistan election that time he was against the nawaz sharif so i saw about the videos they sent the message whatsapp and facebook and twitter and everywhere then i thinking about the in 2018 i made the, some videos and after i lost election 2018 but i made about the videos for about the when i work when i showed about the something in about the different thing so people appreciate and people is about the happy when they saw my video and council work when i showed the video and everything so this time i made a different way and i got a good result because over 2 million people watch my video so i get a good result is it good response from the community yeah um i look the question everybody is asking you I know you might have spoken to the broadcasters, but you're live now on British Muslim TV in a in a in a world exclusive interview since you got elected. Did you know about that naughty graffiti on the video? No, this is about the you know my cameraman innocent mistake. So you didn't know? You know when, no, no, no. Because you know when when we release about this video and. the some somebody is putting about this uh, twitter and facebook and uh, and because the labor party is in blackburn they always watch my video very very serious yeah. and they when they see about this graffiti writing and they put the marking and they send to the viral for about everywhere oh tiger you oh, tiger you tiger do tiger, tiger and asian image reporter who was asked me question same mm. time when he was ring me and say this is my cameraman innocent mistake we don't know about this one yeah okay that you know the this graffiti writing and everything is everywhere on the garage in this park and you know but when i visited this time so i ring to the council and i say please you put the paint here because yeah. you know the family is coming there in the okay. park and everywhere yeah yeah i know we're going to talk about uh, i talk about the voters uh, and that but the, so so the fact that you weren't aware of that it was an innocent uh uh overlooked if you like now i know you've uh, happy to take some questions so we'll open the lines let's take some of your calls 0192423103 let's go to line 1 salam alaikum hello there how are you doing i'm good Just thanks like what's your name I, uh, alistair redmond from the island of isla i'm uh, one of tiger's fans oh excellent and i just want to to phone and say he's doing a wonderful job for his community although i don't live in his area i follow him on social media it's not a surprise to me one because he worked very hard and it's always great to see a fellow conservative councillor get elected and i look forward to see him rise through the ranks of the party yeah do you think do you think he's parliamentary material definitely 100% yeah. um thank you so thank, much thank you. Thank Look, you, thank you. The, what is coming for me? Tiger, the lines, it. Tiger, the lines are crazy in here in the studio. Everybody wants to uh, speak to you tonight. So uh, let's keep the lines open. We'll take some more. Uh, why do you think people vote for you? Because for those who don't live in Blackburn, I know Blackburn because I used to work in Blackburn for another broadcaster. So I know Blackburn, and I know that ward is rock solid Labour. You could put anybody up with a, a rosette, and they would win. Conservatives I'm, don't get looking. Why were people voting for you? Because you know, uh, Mama Shafiq, brother, I'm living here about the, since uh, 15 years in Nordley Range, and I pray namaz in the masjid because uh, when I living here, the, the five masjid is there, and I have a lots of taxi driver friends, and when I see about the outside this uh, road. park or uh, so many fly tipping everything then i'm stand in 2018 yeah. and that time i convinced to the people and my community community i said what was going on man since about the 30 40 years labor ruling here and they mm, nothing doing for our community they not single penny spent in my ward yeah so i, I talk with the discuss every time with about the leaders about this community people and they say tiger patel you stand we give you about the support because you know we can't speak about this front of the people but uh, you can do it something inshallah yeah um do you understand the reluctance of muslims to vote for a party in this case the conservative party that has allegations of islamophobia uh, is very uh, reluctant to speak out against what's happening in gaza how did you give how did you convince voters to give you a chance in that climate 
So about this, uh, you know, when I'm going about this canvassing in my election time, so they ask me this question, but uh, I'm very politely, I give him about this, my answer in about this, in my language. And I say about the, who was involved that time on Iraq war, you know, Tony Blair and party. Yeah, uh, supported and by the Conservative Party. they kill millions party. of the Muslim. They kill millions of the Muslim in Iraq. They kill in Afghanistan. So loss of the women is about the widow. Loss of orphan kids is about the in about the Iraq and Afghanistan. And now, in since after that war, Iraq and Afghanistan, no peace in the world. You see, yeah. no peace in the world. Yeah, but the, the the party that you're standing for supported those wars. They voted yeah, for those wars because because you know I explain in my language. Yeah, say brother, you thinking about that side A or you thinking about the B? So they, they, they understand in my point of view. Mm. Um, and I say about this one, if if about this one, you say about these things, so we have about the four or five parliamentary members, a member of parliament in about this, in about this running government. Yeah. Um, I, and then the other thing is, now you've only been in office for what, a week, over a week? And the rundown park that parents were complaining about has already been yeah. repaired. Are yeah, you surprised they, how quickly you get things done, buddy? No, because you know when I when I see about the in some question I raised it about the made a video say anything about the look like about this before last year did not pick it about the being in my street for about the uh, grabbing when I made a video same time they coming and they pick it up about those all this been and after the you know fly tipping. In about this uh, near the PK food, I made a video in within half an hour. Council sent to the uh, co yeah. community people and they clean it. So when I raise about the, some issues, so Blackman Council thinking we as soon as possible do this job better than about this video is going more viral. But this this video is going over two million people watch. Yeah. And after they put about the swing there, and I'm happy. And I say that time another made a video, and I say about the thank you, Blackman Council. Uh -huh. You do a good job. Yeah, you did a good job. Now, my final question. Now, look, promise me you'll we'll come back again and we'll have a proper conversation. It won't be as rushed uh, next time. Uh, I suppose you know that there's a by election happening in Batley and Spen. Some anonymous questions uh, on WhatsApp asking the question Will you be throwing your name into the hat? Sorry, will I you can't be, hear you. Will you be standing in Batley for the Conservative Party as a parliamentary candidate? Yes, because you know, uh, is uh, people want me going to the more, more and more further because you know this young generation, particularly young generation in Blackburn, they want something change. And inshallah, if I get the parliamentary ticket, so I take a stand because the people want Tabdili, you know. Uh, Tabdili, yeah, for those people who know, yeah. it's called change. I want Tabdili. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Tiger, for joining us. Congratulations once again from everyone here at British Muslim TV. And I look forward to welcoming you back where we can have a more detailed conversation. Uh, it'd be great to get to your community in Blackburn and talk to you about what you're doing there. But thank you so much for joining us tonight. Jajakallah. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum salam warahmatullahi That was Councillor Tiger Patel. Yes, that... Tiger Patel, thank you so much for coming on the programme, sir. Keep safe and best wishes. Um, you were joining us live there from Blackburn, which obviously is an um, issue of concern in terms of the Indian variant of the coronavirus. So as I said uh, at the top of the programme, make sure you get yourself vaccinated, get yourself tested, keep yourself and your communities uh, safe. Just want to finish, um, and I don't think we've heard the last of him. I think he'll be back. I think we'll be hearing him many times here on British Muslim TV. But maybe at a parliamentary seat. I think he got confused between Batley and Blackburn, maybe. But I think, yeah, maybe 2024, next general election, Blackburn might have Tiger Patel as its parliamentary candidate. I wonder how that would go down. But the thing is, the local opponents will get a chance to respond to Councillor Tiger Patel. Next week, Councillor Shokot Hussain uh, will be uh, on the programme amongst many other guests. Thank you so much to the team behind the scenes. It's been a fantastic show. I'll see you very, very soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.